My name is Mike Ritz, uh, call sign W7VO, and I'm the recently elected ARRL second vice president. And one of the questions I always asked is, what the second vice president do? Well, they get to not worry about uh, some of the other stuff that the board does, and they get to concentrate on initiatives. And this is a pet project of mine here that uh, came out about two years ago. There's been significant progress on the Clean Signal Initiative. How many people here have heard of the Clean Signal Initiative or read about it, hopefully, in QSD Magazine? There's been several articles. You know, it takes a long time to develop an, a, a standard for something. Just imagine a room full of engineers, right? And they all have different ideas about how, how they're going to do something or, or get to the end goal. The end goal here, is, of course, is to have clean signals out there and, and be able to operate in a contest and have stations that are tightly packed to each other and still be able to work that guy. Um, the co big contester guys, you know, they may have a different opinion about what that means, as you might imagine, right? They like to have their elbows out, but we're trying to make it a little harder for them to have their elbows out so that little guys can get through, and hence the Clean Signal Initiative. I wanted to introduce our, our esteemed uh, uh, people here that are part of the, uh, the, the committee. Uh, this uh, program was approved by the ARRL board in uh, 2022, I think it was, uh, on a 15 to zero vote. Um, I went and gave a big presentation to the board and they approved it. And then ever since then, we've been in deliberations. We put, put together a really uh, renowned team of subject matter experts in, 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 trans, in uh, analyzing transmitter performance and coming up with metrics that can be used to be part of an IEEE, uh, what's gonna be an IEEE templated standard that could become eventually even an ITU standard. Uh, We've got uh, all of the major manufacturers on board. They're, they are stakeholders in this. They are members of the committee. So this isn't the ARRL coming and telling them what to do. It's you guys, let's work together and come up with, with these parameters and these metrics. Some of the manufacturers are coming up and saying, don't make it easy. And that's good to hear, I can tell you. It's really good to hear. So let's go ahead and introduce the panelists here. We got myself, as I mentioned, W7VO. I'm out of uh, Scappoose, Oregon. How many people know where Scappoose, Oregon is? One, there we go. Yeah, with my, my friend from Tacoma, Washington over there. Uh, George Sp Spata, 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 Spata. We got it wrong both times. W1GKS, who is the uh, new uh, AWRL laboratory manager, George. And of course, every, how many people know Rob Sherwood, NC0B, right? Yeah, he's, he's the guy, right? And he's really been, I want to thank Rob and, and Ken, especially for you two guys out of Colorado, have been really the, the subject matter experts that we have been relying on to get us where we are today. Uh, it's interesting debates, of course, along with, uh, with Ed Hare, uh, W1RFI, um, who has been a, a very good part of our team, and he's really the, the team kind of the team captain on the RFI side. So let's go ahead and get started. What we're going to talk about here, just a couple of really quick topics. Hopefully you guys will have a lot of good questions uh, to ask at the end. We're going to talk about where the Clean Signal Initiative is right now. Um, it's been, uh, if you don't know what it is, I wrote an article uh, about a year ago. It's in QST Magazine, and of course we had the one that just was uh, published here in, uh, in uh, May of this year. So uh, if you don't know what the Clean Signal Initiative is, Come see me at the ARRL booth or see George. Or if you find Rob, ask Rob and we'll uh, be glad to, to tell you what it is, but it's, it's been pretty well publicized. And I want to thank the ARRL for their support of this. The next question is, what can you do to help? Right, you've got a radio, how can you set it up to ensure that you've got as clean a signal as possible? That's part, uh, one part of the equation on CSI is to ensure that the ARRL spends some resources to, pub to publicize to amateurs and teach them how to use their radios. And we're gonna do just a little, you know, short as we can synopsis here of what you can do if you have a radio, an HF radio, and how you can do to minimize the spectrum that you're using. And then finally, a Q&A session at the end. So for now, I'm gonna turn this over to Rob. This is your slide, Rob, and let's talk about a, uh, you know, what, something that he had, uh, uh, what he had as far as a contest and looking at spectrum. All right, thank you, Mike. The slide thing. All right, okay. So this is a real s screenshot of a contest in uh, 2018, AWR 160 meters. And I just sort of took the picture to see how busy the band was. In this case, there were more than 30 stations in a 10 kilohertz swath. And um, 
you also might notice that there's something here that says key clicks. So this is the problem on CWA contesting is we get really crowded, lots of strong signals, and on these strongest signals, you can see here, they're 50 dB of uh, band noise. So we had really a lot of strong signals and you can really hear key clicks. Well, if you look on the left, on that signal that says key clicks 5X, look how wide it is. You can see how wide it is on the band scope and how wide it is in the waterfall. And there's really no excuse for that. If you look over in the right where it says clean, that signal is maybe 3 dB weaker, totally insignificant, but look how narrow that is. On the band scope and the waterfall is even looks narrower. So this is what one of the things that CSI is really trying to hammer home is if we can get the CW key clicks improved, either by menu selection, if the user has to do it, or even the OEM says, we're just not going to allow you to pick a terrible key click option, then this is where, where we'd like to go. And the other thing that I happen to capture, we go back to the one on the left that's wide. There's a tiny little signal trying to peek through the key clicks there on the left. And you can even see the, that guy's signal as little dots in the waterfall. So that would have been really hard to work that guy if the signal was covered up with the key clicks that are that wide. So this is, this is the real world we have to deal with. And in the, the case of so many radios today, I consider everything a software-defined radio. The key, keying waveform and the rise time and all that, that can be updated in firmware. And almost every rig today has a way to update the firmware. So this isn't like you, well, you gotta buy a new radio. Now, the CSI numbers, you may or may not be interested in the exact numbers, but here's an example of a transceiver that's been around a while. It happens to be a Collins 32S3, but that passes the new specification for transmit splatter on sideband. And so the numbers are there. You probably don't need to worry about the numbers, but one thing that's really clear, if we look at the signal here, and look how fast the distortion products fall off. This is a span of plus or minus 20 kilohertz. And at plus or minus 10, we're down 60, or we're down 80 dB. So this is a really clean transmitter. Unfortunately, that was easier to do in the old days with tubes and negative feedback. But as we come along with modern equipment, of course, we don't like, ha ha we don't like not having to tune anymore like we did with an S-Line or a, a Drake or whatever. But the distortion products are worse with a standard solid state transceiver today. Now here's an example of a very popular transceiver. I'm not gonna mention it, but not only was the third order products 10 dB worse, but look how far it spreads out. Instead of being nice and narrow like that at plus or minus 10 kilohertz, they're at plus or minus 20. We're still not even down the 80 dB. So there's where we've got a lot of work that can be done to improve and reduce the interference on the air. Whether it's a contest or just rag chewing, I know I get on 20 meters every Sunday on about 14170, and there's a signal that's usually on about 14175, and he's at least 10 kilohertz wide, weekend after weekend, and there's just no excuse for that. So this is a mask, that's the term really from the broadcast industry, they say, okay, how good are we, can we do this to get the key clicks way down so that we're not bothering each other. Now, one thing that you really have to realize, if you just put a rock in your key, your signal is really narrow. But we send a signal report, maybe in a contest that's always 599, I'm not sure why that is, but uh, we have to, so sending it data, we're sending our zone or whatever we're sending, or it's just rag chewing, it has, it has to have at least a minimum minimum bandwidth, but also we really should have a maximum. So if you can meet this mask where you're not wider than this, then we'll, uh, Mike can talk about how this might be presented in QST, but this is kind of like a, a gold standard. So the other thing that CSI was dealing with besides key clicks and splatter on sideband is transmit composite noise. Now, you probably don't run into this regularly. It's mostly a line of sight situation where signals are very strong, maybe 50 or 60 over nine, but think of field day. It's coming up in the summer. 
and you're going to have possibly a CW station, a sideband station, or an FT8 station all in the same band. So the choice of a transceiver that doesn't transmit a lot of wideband noise is important. So again, we came up with the metrics like what's, what's obtainable, not what's pie in the sky, but what can be obtained. Now, there wasn't a single rig that passed all three, but there were everybody, we could find examples for all the three criteria that someone was this good, and if they can do it, everybody can do it. The last slide here for me is something you can't see all this detail, but if you happen to be interested, like for field day, which rigs would be a good choice that have low transmit composite noise, particularly if you've got two signals on the same band for field day? Then there's a list of all sorts of uh, different rigs, a, a compilation from S53WW, Robbie, and then some of my data. And it was interesting. We both measured it with different equipment. Sometimes we were measuring the same model, and the correlation was very good. In other cases, Robbie had some data I didn't, and vice versa. So if you happen to want to see this in detail, rob at nc0b.com slash CN for composite noise. So it's phonetically, rob at nc0b. Well, no, no. You can send me an email if you want that. This would be my website, nc0b.com slash Charlie Nancy nc0b.com slash Charlie Nancy if you want to see those details. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, and by the way, how the whole CSI thing started, if you're not familiar with it, was I'm a contester. I was doing the ARRL DX contest a couple of years ago, and there was a station in Arizona. I live in Oregon, is Arizona, and I and was had such a bad key clicks on 40 meters. I couldn't I couldn't get within a 10, 15 kilohertz of them, on 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 40 meters because they got you know they was a big station and uh, I've got good antennas and he was loud, but he was also extremely wide. And then after that, I heard. Uh, I heard uh, uh, you know, on the contest reflector, people were complaining about how many dirty, noisy signals there were on the band, and uh, um, it, you know, it, it's like, well, what can we do about it? Well, can we go after the people? Well, no, we can't do that. And then Ward Silver got a hold of me, and we started talking. And no, they, we have to go after the source, right? So what the CSI is attempting to do is to go after the source of the problem. You know, you can you can uh, can't adjudicate it away. You have to make it so that it can't happen, and that's really what we're trying to do on, on the Clean Signal Initiative. I'm going to turn this over now to George, who's going to talk about what you can do as amateurs on the air to, to minimize, you know, you, obviously the, a lot of it's in the rig, but there are settings that you can do in the rig to make sure that your signal is as clean as possible. So, George? It's not a formal FCC standard. Keep in mind that the FCC, if you read the part 307 of part 97, paragraph 307, the only thing they do is say that all the spurious emissions have to be 40, 43 dB below the mean power of the carrier. And oh, by the way, if you read the text, they have to be as narrow as possible with no real other specifications. And so what we're trying to do now is take that and tighten that up to where it's not really, it's not going to be FCC type accepted as it would be, for example, I, I used to work at SBE. You may ever hear of sideband engineers back in the 1960s and so I used to work there, right? And we had to type accept our CB radios and prove to the FCC that we had second harmonics that didn't get into the TV band, right, on channel two. So uh, I, I, that's kind of where, where I come from on this. And we're trying to formalize things that the FCC has this really fairly loose standard. What can we do as the ARRL, the national organization of amateur radio, to turn this into a standard that you know, can, 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 can help amateurs? So the idea is not to make this an FCC standard by any stretch of the imagination. The idea is to, you know, my part of it as being an ARRL guy, is to get the ARRL in the technical standards business. They'll, there'll be follow-on stuff to this later. They may be, we can talk to Rob about doing receive standards, right? The FCC cannot uh, regulate very well the, the stuff coming in. All the stuff's coming in from China that's putting out all these noise. Well, they came out and said, you know what? We need to maybe set, start, start setting receive standards. 
we can't handle the transmit side of it and the noise coming out of all these, uh, these products, we'll have to tighten up the receive specs so that they, they'll, like, they'll ignore and, and, uh, and, and get rid of the noise. We want to be able to, that we're on the front end of that as the National Organization of Amateur Radios. This is really the first step of what's going to wind up eventually being, I hope, a very large project that's going to include, I think, not only transmit side, but the receive side to show the FCC that we are self-policing. And that's the other part of the equation too, right? Amateur radio is self-policing. We're trying to do that for us here. So George is matures. Hello. And to expound on what Mike said just a little bit too, the FCC's interest here are really about interfering with other people. CSI is amateurs helping us all be better amateurs. So it's kind of different. FCC, like I said, they're mainly concerned with don't step on your, you know, they don't want interference with all the government and all the more important people using the airways than, than amateurs are so much. Uh, as Mike said, I'm the uh, ARRL lab manager, replaced Ed Hare about a year ago. Uh, in addition to that, I am also the product review test engineer. So all the reviews you guys see in QST every month, I'm the one that actually does all the testing of the radio, taking over from what uh, Bob Allison had done for the past 15 years or so ago. So uh, although a lot of this with the CSI is we're really trying to encourage the manufacturers to further their designs and uh, build their radios quieter, there's still some things that we can all do to help us along. And the two biggest ones are in the case of key clicks, which Rob talked about. And the biggest thing with key clicks essentially is your rise and fall time, okay? The actual time it takes for that signal to come up to peak, you have your wave and it comes back down. Most modern radios will let you misadjust this to the point where you're getting pretty much nothing but a click. During the CSI testing that we will be doing, um, not only will the radio need to meet the mask, but if the radio can be misadjusted, it will not be eligible for the CSI badge or whatever it is that we're, we're going to be giving in the magazine. So, and again, I know a lot of people have different feelings about that. A lot of big contesters, you know, they, like Mike was saying about putting their elbows out. We're trying to encourage everybody not to do that. And again, just let's be good neighbors. Let's stay clean and everything. So, again, if your radio is always on the fastest setting, chances are you're making clicks. Okay, a lot of, I've worked with a lot of the manufacturers uh, and kind of a middle ground is they will make the default setting not the fastest setting. So you would have to physically go into your radio, crank it down to the one or two millisecond setting, which is gonna make you have clicks on the air. Okay, so if, that, if the radio presents that as a possibility, it's not gonna be able to be awarded the CSI for that, the key click thing specifically. Um, Sideband, so voice processing, compression, expansion, all, e equalization. Anytime you touch any of this stuff, you have the risk of distorting your audio output. The more, what a voice presser or a compressor basically does is it takes the loud sounds and it makes them quieter. It takes the quiet sounds, it makes them louder. So you have a, a, a more average power in the middle. Okay, the processes that do that are going to create distortion and artifacts. The more you, the more you turn that up or turn that on, the better chance you have of having some kind of distortion, which is going to cause splatter. So most manufacturers, they have a very specific procedure that you go through, looking at your ALC meter, how you adjust the voice processor and everything. I highly recommend that you stick to those procedures. If you have a way to monitor your output signal, uh, either with a friend or if you can make a recording of it yourself, listen back to it. And if anything's crunchy or fuzzy or hairy because you have too much processing going on, you're guaranteed you're going to be taking up more, much more bandwidth than you're supposed to. Um, uh, again, the slide says 6 to 10 dB is a rule of thumb for compression. This, of course, is going to change with every single radio. You're just going to have to play with it and find that sweet spot. And again, you should be getting signal reports. Or if you do any kind of major change to your audio processing, just ask, hey, you know, somebody that you might have had many QSOs with in the past, hey, I just made some changes. Am I louder? Am I brighter? Is it crunchy? And this is something that you can do as well. This is not as easy for us to police or adjust so much with the CSI as the key clicks, because then that's more of, like I said, a setting of time, essentially. 
But the speech processing is another big one that we see all the time people taking up way excessive bandwidth because they're thinking, well, if number one is good, then number 10 must be better. But that's not necessarily true. So every microphone is different. Everybody speaks at a different volume. So you really got to play with these settings on your own and adjust them so they're, they're optimum for you, for yourself. Same, again, we already talked about this CW. You don't want to be on the fastest setting necessarily because you're going to get clicks. Just, it, it's going to happen. Uh, and again, we will not, when we do the testing, if the radio is able to be adjusted to where it makes clicks, then it's not going to, uh, it's not going to get the CSI stamp of approval for that. Digital modes, big thing these days. Okay, a lot of people, uh, it's kind of confusing. How do you set up the radio? Where do you put your sound card if you're using a computer or the sound card in the radio? Again, got to follow the manufacturer's suggestions on how to adjust. You have to, if you're using WSJTX, follow the instructions. It's very critical that you have those audio meters not overloading because if you are, you're going to be sending out tons of distortion, taking up way too much width on the band. So again, just like the voice, just like the CW, go through the procedures with what it is that you're specifically using them, follow them to a T. Digital, it's just data here, right? So all we're trying to do is be able to encode and decode the data properly over the air. You're not going to get over on anybody by thinking, well, I'm going to go a few dB over here or crunch this or crunch that. It's really, it's, it's, it's going to make no difference except you're going to be taking out more bandwidth than you should. Um, again, you know, leave the speech and the, the EQ off. Uh, all the different software suggest you do that. There's no need for it, right? There's no need to compress what's already essentially a compressed signal because it's just digital characters going over the air. That's really the meat of it uh, as far as what we, the technical thing that we had uh, planned on presenting to you guys. We'd like it if uh, there were a lot of questions about any of the processes, about either the testing, what the tests mean, how we do the tests. The tests that I do in the lab will continue on as always. At some point, we're not sure exactly when this program will roll out and there will be a radio in some hopefully forthcoming issue of QST that passes at least one of these metrics that we'll be able to put a little star, whatever the badge is. Again, we're all, they're all working that out, the publications people, to figure out what little graphic and what little symbol and all that kind of stuff they'll be giving them. But expect to what we're planning on doing is in the data table, table one of the review, next to the associated specifications, if a radio meets the specification, there'll be a little star. Well, I'm going to call it a star, next to that specification. There'll be a footnote in table one also, again, describing what that star means. If a radio were to get one star, then we're also talking about doing an overall rating for the rig. So if it got one of the three metrics, it would get a bronze, and again, I'm going to call it a star. I don't know if it'll be a star, maybe it'll be a circle. I'm, I'm not sure what the picture is going to be yet. That's yet to be determined. But if they get one metric, it would be a bronze star. If they get two out of the three, they would be a silver star somewhere right at the head of the article. And if they were to get all three, there would be a gold star. So the important thing to remember is if, if you're a CW operator, you never operate phone, you don't care about digital, you're really going to be concerned about looking at the, whether it hits the CW metric or not. If you're a phone guy, you don't do any you know, you don't do any CW. I'm currently not a CW operator. I just started learning, so I'll get there one day. But currently, I would be looking at the phone portion and see what the transmit IMD of the radios are. So again, all this really is, is we're trying to encourage the manufacturers to kind of push them to make their designs better so that there's more room for everybody. And we're really trying to curtail the, you know, what have been some bad practices on the air and people really taking too much space and everything. And uh, again, this will be presented in the form of these awards or whatever you'll call them in QST. Uh, another important thing that has been discussed amongst the group, the working group for the CSI is about current radios. So radios that are still currently being manufactured and are on the shelf, but let's say they're several years old. Um, the current thinking is that we will allow manufacturers to contact us at the league and say, I would like to submit our XYZ that's been out for four years. They would then submit the radio to us, 
and that I would test only for the three CSI metrics. And if they meet any of them, again, there will be a, a special way. And again, we have, this is still all in the infancy as far as getting worked out with publications, where to put this in QST. But there will be mention of uh, a, a manufacturer submitted radio. Um, as you know now, our product review testing for, you know, for integrity's sake, we only take radios from uh, retailers. Um, yeah, do they, do they know it's the ARRL? Maybe. I, I'm, I know they used to go to great lengths and hide who uh, was purchasing these rigs and they would be shipped to us anyway, but we really do go out of our way to just pull a radio off the shelf. We're not accepting anything from manufacturers because we just want a, a very um, representative sample of what you all would go buy when you bought your own radio or when I bought my own radio. Um, it will be a little different. Um, with the submitted radios for CSI only again because that radio has probably already been reviewed in QST in the past. So by asking them to submit one, yeah, could, could, could be a little sticky as far as that goes. I don't anticipate it being a problem uh, myself. Um, there's only so much somebody could do to go in and, you know, modify a single radio to make it better or worse. And if you were going to do that, why wouldn't you do them for all of them anyway? But anyway, that's going to be something that, uh, that we're going to be, again, working out how to do so that somebody could send in whatever of their popular rigs they've been selling for the last five years that wasn't tested for CSI. And obviously, if they think it would meet the criteria for one, two, or all three badges, then we would give them the opportunity to do that. But they are going to have to seek us out. We're not going to be going and looking to retest every radio that's been manufactured in the last 10 years. So at this point, that's the, the meat of the program. As I said, we're hoping to roll this out in the next several months. Um, we're hoping that there is a radio that, again, passes at least one thing, so we have something to show in the magazine. We're not doing anything special with the schedule. We're not going to be putting one aside. Just the month that, you know, whatever, when, when publications is ready and they say, okay, we got the little the doohickey and the picture and the thing and everything that's going to let people know if I had a radio that month, if it passes, one of the three, whatever it is, it's just going to be luck of the draw as far as what, what goes for the first one. Did you, did you have yeah, something? I want to bring up another point. One of, one of the risks when CSI came out is what are going to be the reaction of the manufacturers? You're putting extra burden on them. That may wind up being extra cost. They may tell you to go pack sand, right? How many people here have an ICOM IC7610? Did you get a new software update recently that helped intermodulation distortion on sideband? That was a direct relationship to the, the Clean Signal Initiative. And that's a manufacturer being proactive and, and wanting to, to, to do a good job. And that was really the first thing that we've seen from manufacturers. They went in and looked at it and said, oh. And to me, that's a success. We've got uh, several other you know, major manufacturers we're dealing with that are telling us, come up with standards, you know what, that he can't meet. Because I can. Right? So, I mean, the, and so I, I can't tell you how, how thrilled I am that the manufacturers are, are embracing this. It's not, it's not uh, you know, oh, you're making it horrible for us. You know, it's no, they're, they're stakeholders in this. We brought them in as stakeholders. We're treating them as partners. And it's really come a long, come, come a long way. Now we'll open it up for questions. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. As you mentioned that software updates can fix the key clicks or you adjust it to the slowest rise time. But this pre-distortion that Mike just mentioned. Now, on sideband, without doing something in software, now Apache had been doing what they called pre pure signal. Is anyone here familiar with pure signal from Apache? And this is written by a, a, a W0, Warren Pratt, NR0V, who lives in Lebanon, Colorado. I have a lunch with him about once a month. And so it was software that runs in the, on the computer that runs the Apache. And as Mike just mentioned, Thanksgiving Day last year, ICOM put out a firmware update for the 7610, and I installed that that day. And it's just made a tremendous difference in the distortion, the splatter on sideband. If you happen to be at the Flex, Flex booth, they just announced that their new 8000 series is going to have adaptive pre-distortion. So now we've got three OEMs that are doing uh, 
a great service to re narrowing our splatter sideband bandwidth. So it would be great if all the OEMs could then say, well, it's software, we can do this. Now, in, in some cases, it may require a newer version of the, the product, but like with the 7610 that I'd owned for like seven years, it was just a firmware update. So this is really encouraging that now we have three major OEMs that are cleaning up sideband. Okay, we'll take, take some questions. Well, this is true. So, that's correct. However, if you're running a tube amplifier, in my case, I have alpha and ACOM amplifiers, and this improvement is dramatic because, as you may or may not know, a good tube amplifier is 10, 15, 20 dB cleaner from some information that came from the league in 1997 and, and uh, continue today with testing we do. If you're running a tube amp, in this case of the ICOM improvement, you get the improvement on the air. Unfortunately, if you're running an LDMOS amp, for instance, you get no improvement. So that is absolutely the case. It would be nice if we could encourage ICOM to say, I know you want to sell PW2s, but you also want to sell 7610s. So let's make it easy so you can add the uh, amplifier in the correction loop. With pure signal, this is no problem at all. and um, and what they're showing at Flex now will be adaptive predistortion, and so it, it would work in general, not just with the amplifier they happen to sell. But this is the case where we need to tell our OEMs that we're, say we own their product and we want something to be a little more inclusive, that would be great. You want to do that, George? One of the goals is that the default settings already provide that. To me, that's the ultimate goal. Um, George? Yeah, and again, the going back to every radio is different, every operator is different. Um, follow their, their recommended procedure for setting your voice processors and everything. Again, just assume that the fastest rise time that your radio will set is going to be bad. You don't, for casual operating, you don't need it, even in a contest. What is it doing? It's making noise. So as, as far as, yeah, a cheat sheet would be nice, but... Uh, how many cheat sheets can we really have for, for anything in amateur radio because there's so many variables. Um, again, follow what the manufacturer recommends and then through your own testing uh, or collaborative testing with a friend, you, you should be able to quickly tell when your radio gets to the point where you're misadjusting it and putting out garbage. Anything that we, you know, we can do, any information that we can give, of course, we would. Uh, there will still be a further explanation of all the testing and everything we're doing uh, and the, uh, the document which we're trying to turn into something, again, that's, uh, uh, as Mike said, is uh, based on what the IEEE does for their standards and everything. But the, the short answer is it's really hard to do a cheat sheet because everything is so different. And even a lot of the manufacturers uh, that I have measured in the last couple of years Brand A says it's two milliseconds. Well, guess what? It's one millisecond. Brand A B says it's four milliseconds. Guess what? It's one and a half milliseconds. So you can't even take the numbers that they're telling you as as rule. You just gotta have to experiment with things, unfortunately. Yeah, take the one. yeah always take the slowest one, basically. And, and again, as, as Mike said, and what we're really trying to do, and, and this has happened already in at least one instance I can think of in a pretty popular radio that has come out in the last year or so, is that the manufacturer, we convinced them to make the default uh, something that would not create clicks. So that, again, things, are, things have already kind of been in motion and everything with, uh, with the testing as far as we're concerned.
in the past, if I heard a station that was really splattering and I'd break in and say, by the way, you're splattering, you know, you're overloading my receiver. He's overloading my receiver. Well, he could get away with that 20 years ago. But what you see on the band scope, like I showed you that one example on the CW key clicks, if you see splatter on sideband on your band scope, it's real. You know, if you see key clicks on your band scope because it's so wide, that's real. So they can't get away with that anymore. Yeah, just like I am, right? <laughs> but really, we're talking about direct sampling band scopes. Look at the TS-890S. It's not a direct sampling radio, but the band scope is direct sampling, or a 7300, or a whatever it is. These direct sampling band scopes are very detailed, and it's not phony baloney. It's real. Some people will go get on a web SDR and then record it. Uh, I like to use just friends that I'd maybe talk to on a regular basis and get, how do I, is the EQ right? Or so many stations don't have the EQ right and they're very muffled. You hear this in contests all the time. So I would say friends and maybe a web SDR. Yeah, and, e and even with the a lot of the newer radios that have these abilities to record QSOs and everything on your little SD card and everything, you can, those, a lot of them will record with the settings. So again, just transmit into a dummy load, do a recording and listen back. And then if you hear anything funny, then that you can assume that's what's going to be going out over the air. At some point, if it were to be uh, more mainstream, just like anything else. Yeah, if you read the FCC regulations where it talks about the minimum bandwidth required, and the question is, does ESSB meet that requirement? I guess that's up to amateur interpretation, less otherwise, right? But you know, what's really the need for ESSB other than the guy saying, oh, you sound like my, my FM radio. Well, is that really the goal of, of amateur radio? So, I mean, I get, and, you know, once again, we're looking at how much space is occupied by a signal. And we're trying to minimize that so we can get more people on there. Just imagine what happens if RM11828 comes out and all of a sudden technicians now have a little slice of phone on, on, some, of the lower, on some of the low bands. Imagine how many more signals are going to be out there, right? And so we've got to educate them. We've got to, you know, if you can't educate them, you can't educate them all, is you make the radio so that the radios will behave. My ultimate goal would be to, to, for you to buy a radio that cannot be misadjusted. No matter what you do, it knows what it has to do, you know, it, internally to put out a clean signal, either by monitoring it through the, through the, the software and then saying, oh, I, I can't go that. I'm sorry, Hal, I can't do that. Right? I can't, I can't give you 120% compression, right? But we're not to that point. I'd love to see it get to that point. It'd be a great ultimate goal to have. I'm not an ESSB fan either, but really the, if we can clean up the intermodulation splatter, which makes your signal about three times wider. Admittedly, it depends on the signal noise ratio, whether you hear that. but. If you are, have a guy that's four kilohertz wide on ESSB, we don't want him three times four wide if we can squeeze it in. So it's a, that would be a compromise, I guess. Measuring a 1600 watt, 1500 watt amplifier, you're going to put 1500 watts into 
Yeah, that's typically what we've what we've been doing. We tested at full power, and then we, and then pretty much in every one we've ever tested, we realize if you drop the power even by ten or twenty percent, they're way way cleaner. Any amplifier, even in your even in your barefoot transceiver, you've run it at 100 watts. It's got a lot less IMD at 80 watts. And what's the difference at the at the foot pedal? Not much. Well, you know, I hope that the league will publish the I.O. curve like they did for some of the more recent LDMOS amps. In one case, it was fairly linear, and it only compressed a bit above a kilowatt. Another one, it was much worse, anything above 600 watts, and that curve was like night and day. So that would be nice if that was included. And in this case, the one that had the very bad curve that went like this, the, there was data at rated power and at half power, and it was drastically better at half power. So this is would be very helpful to the amateur to know, okay, I'm ready, I can run full power, but on sideband I better run half, if that's the case with that amp. Okay, we'll get one more question in. Any more questions? Uh, I, I just want to add among all the permutations, uh, Keycliffs and Ritty uh, are a problem as well. Uh, and, uh, 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 you know, I've done some naming and shaming uh, on, uh, on some forums. Okay, well, I want to, at that, I want to say thank you guys very much for listening. Thank you for, if you're an ARRL member, I want to thank you for being an ARRL member and let you know that this is something that we are doing not for ARRL, but we're doing this for all of amateur radio, right? Because everything we can do to, to help amateur radio, help clean up the bands, we're definitely going to do. And uh, once again, uh, thank you guys, and everybody have a great, uh, a great convention. Thank you.